to the Renegade Variety Hour with my co-host, Taryn Harris. I'm Carlos, and we're talking today with Shane Whistler. He has a master's degree in electrical engineering and has been a software developer for the last 20 years. In 2010, he published a book called For Individual Rights, which, according to him, reframes the concept of natural rights into objective terms. Um, his next book, which is going to be coming out pretty soon, is called Reason and Liberty. And according to him, he's introducing metaphysics and metaethics, which gives a foundation for why natural rights ought to be respected. How are you doing today, Shane? Good. How are you doing? Pretty good. Um, so I actually just, uh, you sent me a copy of Reason and Liberty, or at least a kind of an intro copy, which I, I really enjoyed. Um, would you kind of like to uh, introduce your ethical or philosophical system that you are uh, bringing up in this book? Boy, I hope, I hope I can do that. Um, so In one sentence, please. In one sentence. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in chapter one, uh, I address uh, met, what I call metaphysics, which is basically our, the relation of, of our minds to reality, so, or the nature of our perceptions. And, and um, it's a traditional sort of concept going back to Aristotle, but trying to identify exactly the roots of reason. So, um, and then chapter two, I get into metaethics, which is, you know, why should you do something? Um, and it kind of, it's kind of a, a little bit like argumentation ethics, uh, which Hans Hermann Hopp has. It's kind of has a resemblance to it. Uh, it's, a, it's a different take on it, but uh, the idea is that um, if you're philosophizing, then you're using reason, and then that, that premise, if you're going to ask a question, well, what should we do, the premise that we're following reason kind of leads you to other places about things like, for example, natural rights, so if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And that's, that's chapter one and two. And then chapter three is about meaning. So it has to do with concepts. Um, and I can't really get a concise idea of that one. But and then chapter four uh, is about uh, natural rights. Um, and chapter five, I don't know, it might be about virtue. So, Well, that'll, uh, be just, a good, that'll be a good one to add on top of it. Oh, by the way, yeah. um, you shouldn't kill people and don't be a dick. That's the virtue, the moral system, and then you have the uh, the virtue system right after that. Yeah. Um, I came out with the the idea for the book because I wrote uh, for individual rights, and uh, I think it gives a pretty good common sense. First of all, I think it gives an objective definition of natural rights, um, but then it, as far as you know, why I respect nat a person's natural rights, I think I gave a pretty good common sense uh, argument for why, and I think most decent people would would read it and say, yeah, I wouldn't want to buy his natural rights. It wasn't like a rigorous philosophical, you know, answer down to the roots. And so I figured I need to finish the argument, and that's why, you know, I came up with the second book. So, yeah, within libertarianism for, well, I guess forever, whenever you're trying to present any kind of ethical system, you have to have some kind of backing. Uh, and within libertarianism, the idea, uh, I guess, is... Um, from self-ownership, which is kind of axiomatic because you own yourself. Um, therefore, uh, from there, property rights are derived. And from those property rights, that's how we kind of, that's how kind of a, the foundation for an ethical system. So if people impose on our um, rights, uh, then they are acting in an immoral fashion. You stated in uh, For Individual Rights that there was six types of rights, correct? Mm -hmm. What, yeah. what, are, what are those? That I break out. Yeah, I don't uh, start with self-ownership. I start with human action. So I say uh, the basic empirical starting point is that to be alive is to be doing things, is to be acting. And so uh, the issue is that there's a division between actions that don't interfere with other people's actions and actions that do interfere. And so the idea of rights is the actions that don't interfere are rights, and the actions that do interfere are crimes. So you have, uh, you know, that basic division. Um, and so the six, so basically I derive uh, the six rights as categorizations of human actions. Uh, and, um, and the idea is you just get kind of a comprehensive view of the whole set of all human action uh, as it relates, you know, to, to rights. And uh, the first is I call right to self, and that is basically the right to, you know, your body integrity, to, to not be harassed, be able to move from point A to point B on the planet. Um, the right of property is the second one, and that's the right to 
you know, acquire material objects, keep them for yourself. Um, and I regard property as like a well de demarcated object, like an apple or something, or a backpack. Um, and then um, the third right is medium rights. So like, you know, breathing air or uh, if you're flying through with an airplane through space, that's there's a medium you're using, so you have a right to the medium, um, or to the medium you're using, the part of the medium you're using. So, the medium that you're using, can can you explain that one a bit more? Like if a, if an airplane's flying through the air, then it's using a portion of the medium, so it's like flying through some part of the air. Does that make sense? Okay. So something can't just. It's not like it owns the entire. Uh, airspace, but it owns the part that's like right in front of it. It's like claiming ownership of that, and then it lets go. But it's not like a well demarcated object. Okay. It's more it's an action through space or uh, radio waves would be another one, or uh, water rights. Uh, you don't own all the water, but you own a, a right to keep taking water out of the river, for example. Um, sunlight. You know, you don't own the sun, but you own you know, the right not to have it be blocked if you've been using it, right? So those are medium rights. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Okay. Uh, so that's the third one. Then uh, a land right. Does that make sense, Crawl? Or well, the, 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 water, the water right, I mean, isn't that a kind of a, you have the right to be able to attain land. But that doesn't mean that you have the right to a person's land or to land. So I have the right to be able to go and try and get a piece of land or a piece of property. Um, but that does not mean that I have a right to property. Um, yeah, that's kind of semantics as to what you mean. But the last, you, you want to talk about water or I land? Think, well, I water is property. You know, we have rights to access water, not all bodies of water. Has a, owns a property and they have a personal lake. I don't have a right to step onto their property and just fish in their lake. You know, so right. is that really a medium, or how do you make that distinction? Um, well, a medium would be when, if you own the whole object, then you, that's property. That would be ordinary property. But there's there's cases where, like, you know, the air, for example, uh, it just blows across. You know your your land. It's not a it's not an object you can point to, uh, or you know the oceans, uh, rivers, you know streams that go through places. Um, people are using, uh, you know, for example, if you have a big city upstream and another city downstream, and people are pulling water out of the the river, uh, they don't have a right to just dam it because there's people downstream that have been have established medium rights of use to that river, and so you can't just block it. If it's a private lake on your own property, then I would call that, I wouldn't call that a medium, I'd call that an object, I'd call it property. Okay. So Sorry. I just had to clarify medium. that when it comes to bodies of water. Um, yeah, it's not all water. Like once you, once you, you take a pail of water down to a stream and you get a bucket and put it in the bucket, now it's property because it's an actual object. Um, medium is, is I regard, medium right is kind of like a property right, but it's, it's, it's think of the airplane going through the air, it's the right to the airspace that's somewhat in front of the airplane. So it's like he has a right to take these actions he's, he's been taking over time. He has a right to continue to engage in those actions. Uh, same with if you've been using a river, you know, every day going down to the river, you have a right to keep engaging in that action of taking water out of the river. Um, and if somebody just blocks it, even though you've been there for 10 years using the river, uh, then they're violating your medium rights. So you don't own the whole river. You own the prerog You have the prerogative to keep taking that action that you've been taking. You established. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it does. Um, so, uh, so that's the third right. So we get self property, medium, and then land uh, is actually not really a new. Technically, it's not new because uh, it's basically a combination of medium and property. Uh, because land is actually a medium, so that the earth, you know, when you own uh, a plot, you buy a plot of land, you don't actually own the, the plot all the way down to the core of the earth. You know, you you basically own a certain right of action with regard to that plot. Um, you could have, uh, and you don't own all, you know, 
the you know all the way straight above your you know all the airspace above your house. Um, you you own the actions that you need to keep a stable your your house on a stable land. So somebody's mining, you know, say something like natural gas or something, and uh, for some reason it disturbs your house and disturbs your foundations. They violated your medium rights. But if they take some natural gas out that happened to be underneath your land, uh, that's not a violation of your land rights. Really? Okay. So, yeah. All right. Because um, so, you don't own the, to the core of the earth, basically, when you own land. Yeah. So, um, so basically it comes down to whether you were using it or not. So if you, if you were mining the natural gas before and you were using it, then that's a different, different issue. But... Uh, as long as you, as you stop, essentially as long as it's not corroding the property on top of the land, right? So if it it's not interfering with your actually established. Use. Yeah. So, so if, if you, I'm fracking, for instance, um, in a given po part of the area, uh, which um, basically you pump in chemicals into the to the ground in order to be able to extract uh, oil that's that's kind of caught uh, uh, in sediment, um, and then that. Uh, those chemicals then are able to seep in, say, the person's water supply, uh, then you would be imposing onto their property or you'd be imp imposing it against them. But if they're just being able to extract that without taking away any kind of, um, uh, taking, destroying any of your property, then it's fine, essentially, correct? Right. If it doesn't, if it doesn't interfere with your established use pattern with regard to your land, you know, so you, basically, you didn't notice it because it didn't interfere with anything you were doing. Then it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so it has to do with did it interfere with your actual actions over time that you've been taking that you've established? So is the idea. Yeah. Um, then the thing about land is that's where uh, you know people can create house rules for their land. So if you if you own a property, you can create rules for your property. So if somebody comes on your property. You say, you know, uh, if it's too loud after 10, you have to get off my property or something like that. You can just make up rules. Um, and so you can, with that, you can create an HOA, for example. You can create a city state. So you can keep growing. People can connect their land together because they own it. And they can start establishing man-made law that covers everyone's land in the region. And, and that's where government emerges out of. Uh, a local sort of government. Um, the, the smallest local government would be a home where a man's home is, is his castle, and if you don't like his rules, you can leave. Um, you know, next level up would be like an HOA. Next level up would be like a city. Um, Do, now, hold up real quick, man, um, because there was a lot of jumps there. An, uh, homeowners association is what you mean by HOA, correct? You're right. Okay, yeah. and then he brought up city-state. So if you're going to be throwing around terms like that, you're going to have to define what you mean by steady state because state for the longest period of time has to do with a monopoly of uh, force over a given plot of land that is garnered through force and is funded through force. So you're well, justifying a city state right now, so I'm just trying to... Actually, the origin... The libertarians have kind of re re rewritten the history there, but the, the origin of city state goes back to the Greeks. It has to do with like local, like people, like an eight thousand person city. So it's a relatively humble, you know, modest sort of size thing. It's not an empire. Okay. I think that the word that modern libertarians associate with state is more like empire. Yeah, the, or, I mean, the Sumerians who were before the Greeks had a city state system and they had a military. And people were definitely subjected to things, and it was a course of power. Um, so that was a city-state. So, I mean, I'm well, curious about your this, definition. This, That's why I'm, you know, sort of... The, the, the real issue is, you know, how much land can you take? So if you can only take modest amounts of land, like you can only take what you're using, okay? Um, and... I mean, you would you would agree that you can make rules for your own home, right? You can say, hey, if you don't like my rules in my house, get out of my house, yeah. right? You would agree with that, right? Um, and you would agree that same for your land. If you have, like, a fence and you have a yard and all this stuff, you could make rules for your yard, and if you don't like it, leave, right? You would agree. And you, you would agree that you and your neighbor 
can get together and say, hey, we have some rules that we agree with in common. We happen to agree on, you know, if it's really loud past dark mm. or past 10, you know, if we think that's not good and uh, we're, let's have some common rules that you and I agree on. You would agree. I do, do that, because right? they're voluntarily well, entering into those agreements. Right. So. Right, and you, so you would agree that three neighbors could do it, four neighbors could do it. So you keep adding contiguous, and it's very important that they're contiguously owned. It's also very important that the land claim doesn't go beyond, doesn't go to some megalomaniacal, I step onto the continent, therefore it's my whole continent. It's got to be a modest, small scale, rooted in actual use. So, you, you know, it's actually your land that you're using. Well, that's debatable, I think, and, as well. But, okay, yeah, well, I'll skip that part for now. So, okay, what do you think well, is, is, look, if, 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 okay, so if I have a house right now, my neighbor has a house, my neighbor has a house, my neighbor has a house, we all agree, depending on certain, okay, um, no uh, playing music after a certain amount of time or anything else, and the way that you decide to handle these disputes that you're having with your neighbors is say, I'm going to go ahead and hire an outside mediator, or we all collectively put money into an outside mediator to be able to uh, dis, uh, handle these these um, these issues, correct? That's fine. Volition. Well, you can do it however you want. It depends on when you get together with your neighbor, you can write up a contract and you can agree on how disputes will be resolved yes. and you could do it you could do it in however, however you wanted to do it. Well the it, issue so. though is whenever it comes to you brought up the term city state. Now if you want to redefine city state with where it's everybody acting volitionally and it's funded by taxes, then you can, although I would suggest to not use that term because right now that's not what it, it means. It's a, it's a, well, the, the term state, by li libertarians, when they're talking about state, they're not referring to contiguous legitimate ownership and consent. And, uh, and, and I think that's and, and the ancient Greek... Now. Well, if you look at the ancient Greek uh, idea of city-state, they were very modest, small-scale things, like 8,000 people. Okay, It's not like these millions of people over vast areas actually a pretty small thing and I can define term I mean yeah I understand that the word state is a trigger word for libertarians it's been turned into a I trigger word why. and I and I, uh, I can't imagine why you know 200 million people dying over the last hundred years in the name of the state seems like <laughs> oh wow slavery seems like a trigger word that's, with the blacks I don't know why it no seems like an odd thing the word the word is empire but that's not even a, a city state that's an empire because it's not just the city here, it's actually the whole continent or the nation state. So so, so you could call it a nation state or an empire. Uh, but there's different kinds of, of, it's just a word, really. I mean, I, you can tell me, call it, I, I can call it whatever you want for this Well, a concept, though, is but, just uh, a concept or, or the term that we're coming up for is a shorthand way of explaining uh, the entities that, that it makes up. So uh, commonly right now, state has to do I with... Call it, with a monopoly over given juris jurisdiction uh, to be able to use force and handle arbitration. Well, that, that's your definition of state. But I'm saying I have a different definition of city Why state. Do you have a different, so it's, so, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Because you talked about the 8,000 people. You know, um, even if 8,000 people are sort of forced to do different things or coerced, you know. No, okay. nobody should be forced. That's not then, how it should be. So, how does the monopoly uh, over the land occur? Because you. you if you can't have a competing one, if you have a city, uh, it, nothing should be a monopoly. It should all be based on consent. So, uh, like, if you don't want to use the word state, I mean, what word would you prefer that I use? I'm just talking about a voluntary association here. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, violating consent. I'm not talking about monopolies. I'm talking about that you and your neighbors can agree to form an association so that you can live in the kind of neighborhood you want well, to live in. Well, I think using in. a term like you know, state right live. now is redefining, is you're redefining the term state and then justifying it. What would you like, what would you, what would you prefer I call it? Do you want me to call it Sure, else? let's call it, um, you know what, we always play that game with uh, Christians whenever uh, we talk about God. I'd always say, hey, let's call it Nog. And a Nog is omnipresent, omniscient. He can be everywhere and is nowhere at the exact same time. Yeah. So then you end up, it's all a matter of words. So let's call state well, I'm Nog. Saying, what would you sure, why not? 
No, no, no. I'm asking what do you want to call the the concept I'm talking about? That's a voluntary association. Cool. Uh, would you like to call it a city, or what would you like it's to call business, it? Business, right? It's a voluntary association of being able to handle immigration. A business. I mean, it is a business, right? Isn't that what you're going for? I don't think it's a business, but I mean, you want to call. Um, you know. I can call it a voluntary city if you want. Would you want to call it that? Go that ahead okay? with city. Just continue. What, um, I, I'm sorry. I, I do want you to elaborate on the notion of city-state because when I think of city-state, I think of Sumerian culture. And that's just me, you know, with the history that I've focused on. So whenever you talk about Greek society with, you know, 8,000 people, are they all, all 8,000 of these people voluntarily engaging in this agreement? Well, they, they should be. I mean, I, I mean you can, just because you can have a home, I mean, you can, you can have a home where the guy, inside the home uh, grabs, grabs people, kidnaps them, murders them, does all these bad things, but he's still living in a home, right? And we don't change the word home because somebody in there is doing something bad. We still use the word home, and for the same reason I use the word city, whether or not it's bad or good is going on. Okay, there. so what was um, going on within you know, the Greek period that you're talking I mean, about with 8,000 people residing in what you refer to I'm as just, a city-state? Was everything voluntary? I'm just saying the word makes sense, but but from a libertarian point of view, we want everything to be voluntary. Right. So if the so, word city-state has been tainted, then I just want to know originally what um, you think it was. I suppose you know if we've if we've tainted the origins of what the word actually meant, how so? What was it originally when you had eight thousand people in a Greek society? Was it entirely voluntary? Well, no, because you had slaves. Yeah. Probably wasn't. Uh, probably, I mean, but like I said, we don't ch like you can have a home, and inside the home, you can have good things going on where it's violating, you know, not respecting rights, and you can have bad things. And so I don't review, I don't regard the word city state itself as being normative. Uh, I regard it as basically two 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 basic qualities. Number one, uh, that it, it it's a bunch of people living in a in a kind of compact geographical area, it's compact. And the other one is that they are sovereign in a certain sense, so that they don't have a, a nation state telling them what to do. They decide for themselves what what they're going to do within the bounds of it. So it's kind of, it's an independent. It's a concept where they're independent of a national authority. Um, unless they decided they wanted to be to do something. If, with them. if someone in but, the area wanted so, so, to secede from the rules they that that were posted forward, right? Um, what would occur? It depends on the original agreement. Um, so if you uh, it, this come comes down to things like um, you know, can you make a contract? For example, let's say I build a house. And there's a road in front of it, and there's some empty area behind my house. And you come to me and you say, "Hey, can I build behind your house?" And and I say, "Sure." And you say, "Well," and then you say, "Well, I'm going to need to get to the road, and so I'm going to have to go through your land to get to the road." Uh, and and so, would you agree with me that I could I can have egress through your property? And I can say, "No, I don't want you to do that." Right? I can also say. Uh, well, yes, but I might take. I might uh, say I might change my mind later, right? Or I can say yes. I will give you a, per a contract that says you have perpetual right to cross my land, right? So I could do three of those types of things if I wanted, yeah. correct? Yes. Okay. So, so if you formed a city, you could form a city state according to those, you know, three approaches. And you know, the first approach might be nobody agrees on to to follow anybody else's laws, right? They just say, no, I don't want to join this association. I just happen to be living nearby, right? Because uh, I'm afraid of governments, for example. So they might not agree. Uh, or they might say, you know what, I'll go along with it as long as I like, but when I want to change my mind, I'm going to get out, right? Or they could grant and say, no, okay, I will give you forever a, uh, a, right, a, 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 a right to kick me out if I don't follow the city ordinances, I think you can give that. So it depends. In other words, it depends uh, on which thing you agreed to. So you don't have to agree to 
a, a binding forever. It just depends. I think anarchists might, some anarchists might be kind of alarmed about making a government, and they might say, you know what, I'm never going to sign an agreement like that, right? And some of them might say, you know what, I don't want my next-door neighbor to opt out, and then all of a sudden he's going to be noisy after the time that we agreed on, right? I want to live in a neighborhood where I can trust what's going to happen, right? right? So different people might want different styles, and that's okay. It should be, people should be free to experiment and try the different styles you know, for themselves. Okay. Well, the th to me, that is the, the reason why, and I, you can call it a semantic thing if you want, um, whenever, what you just discussed there was volitional, right? So Hans Hermann Hoppe and Stefan Molyneux and a few of them, I think they believe the, the term is dispute regulatory organization, which is like how you handle arbitration. Um, we have an independent mediator in order to be able to figure out whatever we want to be able to do based off contracts. As long as it's all volitional, I have no issue with this. The problem I'm having here is that the term state, I, I, it, it does, uh, there is a very, very good reason why an anarchist would have an issue with that. For the same reason that I would, uh, a former slave would have an issue with the term master. Um, there is a, a very bad history. Uh, throughout all of history, regards to the state. Uh, so I, I don't know why you would continue to want to call it the government if it's based off of volition. I, well, I don't agree with I don't agree with all, all that interpretation, but that's kind of a long. I, I wrote like a twenty-three or twenty-four page uh, argument about that whole thing. Um, kind that of that's disproving what I'm saying. All you said is that you wrote an argument. No, but it, you seem. <laughs> Well, I know I'm not disproving. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not disproving what you're saying. I think. Well, okay. First of all, there's the words we use, and then there's the meaning we have. And I guess, I guess it would be more productive to talk about what I mean than rather you don't like the word I use. Uh, I don't. I don't. I guess I don't care. You don't like the word. I'm okay. We can call it something else uh, for the purposes. Of this but I mean, discussion. you state you that you What's have an important? issue with anarchists. So you're using a term there. I, I have an issue. I have an issue with the big deal that is being made about the word. I have an issue with that. But I, why are you I don't trying to save it, it, basically? Why are you trying to save the term when it, it does? I, I, I'm i kind of an anarchist when it comes to words, actually. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I have a complete freedom to pick what word I want to pick, and that if I'm having a discussion, that the other party can try to understand what I mean. Or they can kind of be a dictator and insist I use their word, or they can insist I don't use their word. And I don't really – and so I'm kind of an anarchist that way. I think anarchists are kind of – they dictate to me I can't use such and such word. And I'm like, I can use the word. I mean, what matters is if I don't violate your rights or if I don't advocate violating your rights. That's well, what matters. there's also the winning an argument. And whenever you use terms which already have meanings before you even entered into discussion, which well, a government, government means a monopoly over – um, over uh, over arbitration over a given area, which is implemented through the well, and funded by the use of taxation, which is theft. I could see like, there being maybe, you know, oh, well, I don't really care that I that you you think these terms mean this thing, but I'm just being an anarchist. I mean, that's, that's this is chapter three. This is chapter three of the of the next book I'm writing is on meaning, and and actually I call that conceptual fascism where people say, you must mean this by this word, or our ancestors meant this by this word, so you've got to mean this by that word. I actually don't like that very much. I think we can create meanings, and as long as we're clear in the conversation what we mean, then I think people should have a mental flexibility and be able to say, oh, yeah. I well, in your latest that. book, I can... when I was reading your, your latest book, though, you decided to, that you wanted to define your own definition of anarchism, and then you decided you wanted to define your own definition of a government, and then you go, oh, well, guess what? Anarchism is wrong, and the government is good, because I decided to define him in this certain in these certain terms. I'm well, not sure you, what you, you were going, You were basically stating that, that anarchists are making all these flaws, because uh, one of the points you bring up is because anarchists interpret the government as being inherently bad because all governments throughout history have taken away individuals' rights. And then you state that anarchists are having some kind of policy or something because we did not think the state uh, 
can ever promote individual rights because they never have. I do not think that is fallacious. I think that's being completely rational. If every single time I went to a panther, it bit me in the neck, it would be rational for me to step away from the panther and never go towards it again. Throughout, all, throughout history, governments have been that panther. They have stamp, stampeded on people's rights, and they've been doing it in, in a number of different ways throughout history, depending on the amount of revenue that they can get. Especially now, they are able to get a lot of revenue due to the wonderful abundance of money that was brought to you by the free market for that small amount of time. Um, so I don't, I, I don't see why I would, I would try in any way to uh, to save the term government or to defend. Not all anarchists. You realize not all anarchists are against the term government. I don't care. Right? <laughs> okay, I'm just saying that there's lots of different kinds. Yes, they're from communists, which I'm. I just. Well, no, no. There's libertarian, individualist, free market anarchists who are okay with the word government. They use the word government for voluntary association, like it's okay to create a local voluntary government. And they use the word state when they want to talk about the really bad thing. And there, there are anarchists like that. Um, there's, I'm, there's anarchists like you that don't even like the word government. There's different. There's like, you know, and almost every anarchist you talk to has their own personal little take on anarchism, and uh, it's impossible to actually address anarchism as such unless you address every personal variation of anarchism. So can I ask you, um, you talked about you know, redefining the meaning of certain words, and you're going to think that I'm a fascist dictator in this sense when it comes to words. <laughs> To be honest, because I I tend to think that you know words are a medium, it's something that we use as a medium by which to communicate what we're trying to communicate to one another in terms of concepts. So instead of you know changing up the meaning, why not just create another word in order to sort of express what it is that you're trying to convey? Why do we have to change the meaning of a word that already exists, that already has a definition, in order and just redefine it? Because because the word has enough meaning with it that uh, it's better to reform the word and modify it. And this happens yeah. throughout history. I mean, words don't always, they don't always stick with the original meaning. They evolve over time. And the reason that the meaning evolves is because individuals decide to, to instill some new meaning, a new twist, new pers perspective on the word. Uh, and so even if you wanted to pin down the meaning forever, it wouldn't happen. Um, and, and it just so happens that I'm the kind of person that tends to try to push the meanings of the words in a certain direction. How's that going? Evolve them. Uh, I did, uh, I've also done that for uh, natural, you know, the concept of natural rights. I don't mean, you know, people say, oh, natural rights don't exist or they're a myth or all these things. But which version of natural rights are you talking about? You know, uh, so I have a different definition of natural rights it's, that carries – the same spirit of natural rights that was always there, but but changes the perspective a little bit to make it more solid. So I'm trying to rescue the spirit of what they were trying to do. So that's why I use the same word, is because I have the same intention. I'm trying to actually, I'm trying to come up with a, an objective way uh, to define how human beings should interact with each other. And so therefore, since I have the same intention they did, I'm trying to use the same word. I'm trying to rescue kind of the word. Um, so this just so, I mean, I, I don't see a pro, I don't see the big deal. Some people make a big deal out of it with me and I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, I'm okay. I can go in a conversation and I say, what do you mean by this term? And they tell me, and now I can have a conversation because I know what they mean. But then when I use a word, the, some people get really irate because I use a word in a, in a slightly different way. Well, I think, I think it's, it's just that we wanted strange. consistency in order to communicate effectively with one another. And if we always have our own personal meaning for a word, then how, to, how can we... Well, you should... I need to define my terms for you. I mean, I don't expect you to... I don't expect you to understand it before I tell you what I mean by it. What I'm talking about is once I've told you what I mean by it, then it seems like... Yeah, but what if I were to read... I mean, it's like people today who redefine... You know, they say God is love, and they re re completely redefine the word God and what it means. I mean... <laughs> I'm not saying you do it for... I'm not saying you do it as a whim or you just do it to try to be crazy. I'm doing, you do it for certain, like I just explained why I use the term natural right, even though it's not exactly the same meaning everybody had by it before. Uh, I just explained, I think, a rational reason why I would use the same term to mean something 
it's not quite the same thing. I think I have a rational reason. That's different from... I would like to bring something up there real quick. Negro means, comes derived from the word black in Spanish, right? Negro. If I constantly call black people Negroes, no matter my intent, it's probably going to have a backlash. And there's a very good reason for it because Negro has been used as a term of that's been used by racists for a very long period of time. Well, government has been a term which has been used in order to instill slavery among billions of individuals for a very long period of time. Do you understand why someone then have an issue with the, using the term government to mean volitional? I, I just see it as symbolic. I mean, just it, there's concepts and there's words. So we can create a concept and the concept can exist completely independent of the word, right? And so you mean what you mean. It doesn't matter what the word is. And the word is kind of the very last step. It's kind of like paint that you put, you know, a certain color of paint on the concept. And now that means that. And, and for me, it's like I can use different labels and tags. I mean, I can lear, learn Japanese or Spanish or I can – I mean, to me, it's completely flexible as to what words you attach to the concept, and the important thing is well, the, how, the concept. How are you different than anarchists, uh, so, by the way? So you're, if you're, if you believe in volitional relationships with individuals, how are you not an anarchist? I think many, most anarchists, or many think I am an anarchist. I was going to say, you're not so much like an anarchist. <laughs> so I, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I mean, you, in well, a good way. I mean, in a very good way. Like you believe in, you know, volitional agreements and relationships, and you know, you don't believe in coercive entities. You know, infringing on people's lives. So this is why I guess we're so interested and we're sort of battling in regards to words. You know. Well, most anarchists that I've run into will say, "Ah, oh, you're an anarchist." When I have a talk, when I discuss with them, um, and if you go to my uh, go to Amazon and look at my book, you'll see a review there by an anarchist <laughs> who basically spells out, he spells out, okay. "Oh, this guy's really an anarchist," but he just doesn't like. He's, I just don't like the word anarchy, or I think it's. He thinks I, it's. I'm doing it for tactical reasons. He, he's he's wrong, but but he he. But anyway, it's pretty common because I actually I am a hundred percent pro consent. I mean, a hundred percent voluntary. Uh, it just comes down to. I mean, it comes down to, I think, we can form associations if we want to. We have, If we want to agree with people to form an association, uh, and I just look at it and say, look, if I – now, I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying you could do it exactly the way you want or the way Murray Rothbard wants. It just depends on what the people want to do. So if, But if the people in the area wanted to form a city-state or whatever you want to call it, want to form an organization, and they wanted to have – a police force they shared in common. If they wanted to have a fire department, they shared in common. If they wanted to have courthouse, they shared in common. If they wanted to have this sort of system voluntarily, they could do it. And the thing is, is if you step in there and you walk around, you're going to look and you're going to say, well, this looks like a government to me. It just looks like a good government versus a bad one. So, I mean, to me, it shares all the qualities. It's just, I mean, we, we haven't gotten rid of the, the term government. Government has changed a lot over all the past you know, centuries or millennia, you know, it's changed from, you know, theocracy or, or a, you know, um, you know, oligarchy or, uh, you know, all these different forms we've gone through. We've never said, oh, it's not government anymore just because it changed the form. Um, and so I just see that the emergence of a libertarian or liberty-oriented or consent-oriented government is just another type like all the other types. Okay. Of types. Yeah, I mean, I've heard the argument where they say, you know, if you have a free society, eventually you're going to develop a system that reflects what a government is. Um, Which is fun that people come up with the assumption that they would know how a volitional <laughs> system would work. I have to ask, why? Why do you not use the word? I don't. I don't pretend to prescribe how it will work. Um, I th all I argue is they can do it if they want to. Number one. Number two, I would look around and I'd say, well, most people seem to want to because look what's going on. So. Uh, the issue I have is, you know, it ought to be perfectly voluntary. That's my, that is my only problem with what their preferences. I mean, they can have their preferences to form their associations, their governments, whatever they want. They can do it, but they have to respect uh, individual rights, and that's all I care about. I don't care about uh, the structures. I don't care about 
defense organizations or the you know DROs or whatever you want to call them, those are all issues of technicalities of how people could do it if they wanted to, but they don't have to do it that way, right? So they could do it how they want. So I just care, don't violate rights. So whatever it is you come up with, don't violate rights while you do it. Now, I, personal, I have a personal preference. You know, I, I like the idea of living in a fairly large community, you know, 10,000, even a you know, million people is okay. I like the idea of having, you know, certain regulations about, you know, so that, you know, people are safe, uh, so that it's not noisy after 10. You know, I kind of would like to live in a neighborhood. You know, I've got a little girl. I'd like to live in a neighborhood where if you have a dog that's bigger than a certain size, maybe you should go live in the other neighborhood. Um, and I, But it should be voluntary. I mean, if I can't find a neighborhood like that, well, that's a tough break for me. But, but you know, um, but I like that idea. An anarchist might not like it. He might want to live in a more loose, kind of, we don't, we don't make rules up around here kind of way. And I think that's fine, too. I think he should be able to form a community of people where they're free to do it exactly the what way they want. What you're is an anarch anarchical system. Well, I, um, maybe, I don't know. But I don't know. Answer, fuck why, try, fuck why, trying to define the why terms. Do you, why do you find um, the word anarchy it's, to be have sort of a negative connotation to it? Do you think it, it, it do you think it absolutely correlates with the idea of chaos? Because I, originally the word anarchy just means a people without rulers. So. Well, I, I would agree. If you define it that way, I, then I'm I'm an anarchist. So. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. It only took uh, an hour. Um. No, 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 Fucking around, man. No, but I, I just have to ask, you know, um, because it seems like you if, have this idea that the negative connotation and the anarchy correlates with you, fearing the government. It just means that we don't want to be associated with, with it. If you really want to understand exactly why I don't prefer the term anarchy, uh, I have an essay called Against Anarchism. Which I read. And I got... And I go through the, all the reasons that I could possibly find talking to anarchists, and I address all the things I could come up with. So you could read that. But I don't like the term. Okay. Okay. I know that. Uh, also, I think, I, think it, uh, I think that we want to evolve our society toward a free society, and I think that given that a voluntary system can resemble the kinds of systems we have now, it can resemble them if the people want it. I think it, it opens up more of a an evolutionary step-by-step -step way of getting from where we are now to where we want to be rather than if we draw this kind of uh, radical line and saying everything the way it is now is just all wrong. We need to throw it away. We can go to our fellow citizens and say, hey, you know, it's not that radical or big of a change. It's just stop interfering with rights you can still organize the way you're organizing if you prefer that to do that. You can still have your local city. You can still have your state of Utah. You can still have your America. You can have it all, but you got to take away all these rights. And how are they? And how are they going to decide? By the way, in those areas where it's say eight or ten thousand people, where are they, how are they going to decide on um, these are the regulations we're going to implement? Are they going to do it by voting? Are they going to do it? Already, I already bought my property. I don't want to have to care about what size of dog that I'm supposed to have. It comes down to what you've agreed to ahead of time. If you if you have agreed to that it's going to be based on vote, then that's what it's going to be based on. If you've said no, I don't like th I don't like basing it on vote. I'm going to go live in this other association where we don't do it based on vote. And that's well, we went from a constitution so to the government we have. The government we have now. So apparently, voting turned out to be not so great, or trusting other people. There's nothing particularly tyrannical about voting per se. I mean, you we can all get together and say, "Hey, we're going to go out to pizza. Let's vote on where we're going to go, and we'll go. We'll, we'll go to the we'll go to the restaurant we all that most of us want to go to, and, and people living in a city could vote if that's how they want to run things. There's nothing. There's nothing." non-consensual about voting. The thing that's not consensual is when you didn't agree to the system of voting ahead of time and then you're forced to submit to the voting system that you didn't agree to, 
That's what happens when you're born into right? it? Say, because I mean, you can make the exact same argument for the United States government. Look, you live here right now. You have to go by what they're saying right now because you were born into a system which is based in taxation. You have to give this amount of money. You were born into, based off of uh, laws which were written by people a long time ago, and we've been voting to create more and more laws since then. But since you live here, you cannot complain because this is our house. Well, the most you can do is vote. Well. When I was talking about vote, I'm talking about local talking property. About localized voting specifically? Okay. Yes, I was only talking about where you actually own the property, then you can set those kind of rules up. But the United States is trying to govern a whole continent, and it doesn't own the whole continent. So it can't make up rules and assert it onto everybody on the continent because it's not its but who, property. But who can, the know? state of Texas? But, like how small... No, it can't. It can't either. It can only be. What about be, San Antonio? What can, about a smaller city? Can then it's okay then? Only can, only if we're talking about well, there's there's issues of transition, but if we're talking about, you know, if it was formed the right way, uh, then only contiguous where where the property owners are adjoined to each other and they form a contiguous uh, entity where they have all voluntarily agreed that this is the system. Could they do it? So that's, it's a very modest, small-scale sort of thing where they could do that. Uh, you can't do that at a state level. You can't do that at a, at a United States government level. At least you can't do it concerning things that aren't related to natural rights. But you can do it at a city-state so level? You can do it if the members agree that that's how it's done. If you've agreed, I mean, if you've come into it and you've agreed, here's how we decide these sorts of things, then that's what you agreed to. You don't have to agree to it. I'm not saying you have to you have to join that sort of thing. And if people didn't like it, then people leave to the other city states that didn't do it that way and, and the other and they'd shrink and go away. Does my property go away if I de if I decide I no longer want to live under these regulations? Did you agree to live under the regulations or not? Well, which which who owned question. the property originally? Did the regulators yeah, own, well, look? So I agree. I bought this this part of land, right? And we got all these other people here. Uh, we decided, you know, previously, okay, you know what? Um, we all kind of want to live based off of these things, yada yada, right? Um, well, I did. I decide, um, you know, 20 years in. Well, you know what? I am such and such religion now, and I don't believe that I should have to live by these regulations anymore. Do I have to? give up my property, or can I stay in my property? Well, if you agreed ahead of time, then you, in a sense, you already gave up your property. So you, you basically had given up um, and a, the term. You, you've already made a covenant with the other people. You entered into a contract, and you gave up certain rights and enjoyment to your property ahead of time already. Now, you don't, like I said, you don't have to sign that contract if you don't want to, but we're talking about where you did. So you did give your property to, to these people or give certain rights to these people or use of your property. So who owns it after uh, you now lose your rights because you no longer want to you, live on this? I mean, you, you no longer apparently own the property because you... That depends. That would depend on the terms. Like the terms might be that we will give you so many gold coins that, that are the market value of your land, if you don't want to follow the rules, you can take your gold and go buy some property somewhere else. That might be one way to resolve that kind of thing. But if you just say, well, I'm just going to unilaterally break this covenant and this contract I agreed with, you're basically stealing from all the other people around you because you gave them a right of enjoyment of your property that you would follow these rules that they wanted you to follow. You gave that to them. And if you just unilaterally take it back, then you're a thief at that point. Yeah, what if what if that so, localized voting system, though, well, I, I know that your point is to not infringe on individual rights, but I think in the history of humankind, local governments, like the one that you're describing, that has a voting system that gets pretty complex at some point, just begins to grow and eventually does infringe on individuals' rights. I mean, how do you think this would be prevented or stopped? There, there's no... There's actually no system, including anarchism, that will resolve the problem of people, human beings, who don't understand rights, or who don't understand how to respect rights. It doesn't matter what system you come up with, you're, you're host. I mean, you can't, 
So yeah, there are the sociopaths. Only thing that solves I mean, incredibly the only thing rare. That solves, yeah. The only thing that solves it is that people have a good understanding of natural rights and how it works, and they brought up in a culture that respects natural rights. Um, other than that, you're, you're just so what do you think about property that someone owns that they're not using, but that they've purchased, they have, that they fenced off, that is their property, um, but they don't use it. They just happen to own a ranch or own a piece of land, um, but it's not being put to use. Do you consider if that? They own a, if it's a ranch that, that's being put to use, okay, right? Sorry, never mind. If they have a piece of property they fenced off, but they're not currently using it, but they own it. You know. I, I would regard it. If there's if there's actually no use whatsoever, uh, then I would regard that as a claim, uh, but I wouldn't regard it as ownership. So it's kind of like saying, "Hey, I want that thing. I'm going to use it at some point. So you know, don't don't go there and violate my claim." But I don't regard a claim as ownership per se. Um, so it could be uh, if you don't exercise your claim after a certain amount of time. Uh, under certain conditions, the claim might be uh, vacated. And who decides, you know, the amount of time that, or you know, needs to? Well, first of all, we're gonna have this awesome contract, so it's all let's gonna be understand. settled, and let's everybody's rights gonna be met because this contract's claim, gonna be solid. A claim can be uh, arbitrarily large in size, right? So you could claim huge okay, amounts. Okay, to of own them, the mountains in right? the sea, I, I. I I get if, if you're going to go there, but... Well, no, that that is the that is the only place that matters, is that is if you don't have an objective definition of ownership that's based in actual use, then there's nothing that will limit the claim. Uh, there's no way to limit it in scope. And then somebody can claim that they own the whole continent, the whole United States, right? So the United States government can claim that they own the whole thing and then tax you for using their land. Right. Yeah. And so that, that that's why that's why I define it that way. I mean, I understand the fear of saying, oh, well, I I bought this real estate and I want it to be mine forever, even though I'm never using it. I understand that for investment, but, uh, for, for, investment hmm? for, for investment purposes. I mean, some people regard their right. property that they're not using as an investment. Well, if if we didn't have the system we have now where it's kind of a fiat ownership, like you own it just because you say so. Uh, if we didn't have the system, people wouldn't invest that way. They would invest different ways. Um, um, potentially. I mean, there are certain places in the world where people really want to live because of the climate, because of the access to resources. So, you know, those places are very high in value. Um, well, right. But presumably, you're, you're actually taking steps to live there because of that, right? You're actually, you claim it, and then you start taking actions to, to start utilizing it, you you build on you start building, you dig a dig a hole, you start doing things, right? So you, so that's beyond that's not claim anymore if you're actually doing things. Okay. What yeah, claiming it's, is just, it's a lock thing, right? All right. Forgive the hypotheticals that I'm going to ask you, <laughs> um, and the scenarios that I'm throwing at you. But you know, what if you purchased a piece of property from someone who had owned it, and you don't use it for a while, but you have an intent of using it. You have a contractual that, ownership of the land. Right. Okay. But that's not, at what point does it become a claim? You know, if you don't use it for 20 I can't, years. I have no idea. So there's that's, no set lines. I mean, I'm just wondering. I, I just, I'm just identifying the principle of claiming versus owning. The principle of claiming is basically, hey, I want that. You're declaring to the world, hey, that's mine. Right? That's claiming. Right? Yeah. So you just, and, and you could be drawing a line on a map or registering with a local agency or it could be maybe you put up a cheap fence around it or whatever you do. A claim is just kind of just pointing and telling the world, I want that, right? Whereas, and so I'm just saying that's a certain type of thing, whereas ownership is an actual, uh, it's much more intensively involved. It's kind of like locks mixing labor with the land, you know, that sort of concept where you're actually using it, and it's, it's actually connected to your living actions. It's not just an intention. You know, yeah. a claim is just an intention, right? right. And you can, you can say, well, I, I intend to own the whole state of Texas or something like that. Um, but it, the, the point is to identify the principle. Now, how do, you let, how do you get lawyers to decide when does it, this happen or that happen? I don't know that. I'm just identifying the principle. I don't mm -hmm. I have no idea. Yeah, I have no problem. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's Locke. Locke talked about it a lot, and I, you know, I, I remember listening to Kinsella, and he was bringing up some stuff regarding that that kind of uh, the fact that you have to work the land, or in some kind of way, uh, has something to do with labor theory of value, and therefore. But you know what? I'm going to totally fuck up his argument. I think it makes it makes rational enough sense for the fact that you have to actually use the land uh, in order for ownership to really make much sense. Um, if you just have this bit of land that just exists for a hundred years and nothing has ever been done to it, I uh, you know, it doesn't seem very rational to me. But I mean, I could I could be wrong, but I, I can definitely understand where you're coming from with that. I'm just, I don't actually connect it to labor theory of value. I connect it to your living actions. So if you are doing things uh, over time, you're behaving a certain way, and it's connected to some property, your actions, your, your human action is connected to some property, then that's your property. And so to take it from you is to interfere with your life, okay? It's to infringe with what you're doing. Uh, and so, but a claim... Uh, a mere claim where you just say, hey, I want that, but you aren't doing anything with it, you aren't a, then to take it away from you doesn't actually interfere with anything because you aren't doing anything with, with it. What if someone was uh, walking on you know, their property and the acreage that they purchased and they enjoy having that private space and that solitude and they consider that their property they fenced off, do you define that as doing something with it or does something actually have to be built and established in order for it to be their property? Because a lot of people would say you're not putting it to use, but they would say, well, I'm using it for my pleasure. Of course I am. Yeah, and I think the, the – now, I think that you should be able to claim – the thing is if there's, if there's a whole bunch of, of, of land all of, like in Texas, it's all you know, land everywhere, and uh, you, do, you make a claim, and then, but there's like thousands of similar claims nearby that people could make, then regardless of whether we can say you own it or don't own it, they should stay away from your claim regardless. So if there's enough resources around that you could just say, hey, this is, I'm using this, leave me alone, it, it shouldn't even come up as somebody contesting your claim so, so long as there's tons of it around. Uh, but when, you know, suppose that the Earth's population got to be so big that, you know, you being able to walk in your woods every three months was making it so there's, you know, people who couldn't own something, the question is going to come up, are they actually using it, uh, or is it just a claim? And I'm not trying to adjudicate that. I think it might depend on lots of different things. But um, but what, what I'm saying is that I think in the world we live in now, uh, you could make lots of claims like that, and they should be respected over time. Um, and you could sell those like property. Uh, and the reason why is because there's just so much land everywhere. Right. And so so uh, it doesn't come up. I'm just thinking of the long term, you know, and, and I'm thinking of the problem of where you claim the whole continent, the whole United States. And the, that's my big the biggest problem I see is that the United States government is basically claimed as if they own the whole place. So, oh, so make they outright say that they do. You're right. Yeah. Right. And so they they, they make up rules, make up man made rules that go beyond natural rights and they enforce them on all of us. Even though it's not their house, it's like their, it's my house, my rules, my country, my rules, uh, and so I'm trying to stop that. Is is like one of the main things, because otherwise, if you have no limit, then they can do stuff like that and argue against it. Yeah, but the government. I mean, I see that as being a mob taking over a continent. You know, if we had one individual that said, "I own the entire continent," it would be a joke, right? I mean, we <laughs> we as individuals just would. <laughs> Clearly. It should be just as big of a joke as the as you know, a whole government does it. Yeah, and we agree on that. Yeah, and the thing, okay, so a lot of what we're discussing right now is theoretical, right? Which is fun. It's very Walter Block, and it's a good time. And I think right now, though, is uh, is what what, and I'm pretty sure you'd agree with me is that a cultural shift does have to occur in order for there to be. Uh, a change, substantial change. And that cultural change will not come only through giving logical arguments because, honestly, they did not arrive at many of the points that they believe in due to logical arguments. It's government good, other things bad. And that has a lot to do with the fact that they were stuck in public schooling for, say, 13 years, were in abusive relationships, or there were abusive relationships with their own parents, which can be incredibly traumatizing to individuals. I 
the the way that people uh, act or think of the state is very much in the same way that they act and think uh, with their parents. Uh, they know what's right for us. They know what's best for us, and it's their land. Therefore, they're allowed to do with what with what it is they want because they know best. Um, so I think there has to be, as, as you spoke about, a, uh, a, a cultural shift there. And it's not only going to be through logical arguments. We're going to have to win with them emotionally as well, with individuals emotionally as well, because that is that is very important. Uh, it's not just about going, oh, well, your argument sucks because there's a fallacy. It's like, I understand where you're coming from. I understand there are issues that are arising. And I understand that you are concerned what would happen if we were living in a voluntary society. So having the... The kind of theoretical framework, at least a little bit edged, uh, like etched out, uh, I think is is very beneficial um, because it gives them at least like, okay, well, I'm kind of comfortable with that idea, which I, I definitely understand where you're coming from with your city-state. I wouldn't use the term state because I'm trying to step away from using the language of, of violence, which a lot of people recognize the state as being one of those. Um and giving them that kind of a hope while also giving them the moral argument and giving them the argument from, look, um, certain things are going to have to change because whether we like it, there's going to be a shift. So we want it to be a shift towards tyranny, which will only lead to a fallen government in general, or do we want this to be peaceful transition? Either way, the state's going to fall due to um, the debt and everything else and basically us out of the state. Um, so... I, I applaud your ability to be able to write what you're writing right now and being able to get out the message in the way that you are. Um, I think that we're disagreeing on the terms that we're choosing to use. But outside of the terms, I think the what we're describing is very similar. And I think we're both kind of arriving at a similar point. Um, would you agree, pretty much, uh, that we're both... I think we're both going to go for kind of a, a, a new kind of a freedom movement. And we're just trying to figure out the exact little bits of like, what we should all, do. Is this about all semantics? <laughs> I, before, before I answer, can I list my last two out of the six rights? Yes, please. Go for it. Okay. I'm, I, consent, I'm not going to yell at you, I assure you. <laughs> okay. Consent? Uh, consent. So you have a right of consent, which is has to do with creating contracts and agreements and things, uh, and also just day-to-day -day agreeing with things. Um, and then the right of justice, which is the right to put an end to interferences with your rights. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I, I okay. can so agree to talk to you, and if you decide to stick a gun on my face, I'm I can shoot you in the face. Those are um, right. You can stop the interference. I know that I keep on taking so your book and writing it down in like one little sentences, but you know. That's good. <laughs> Meet you understand it. Is yeah. What it means. Here's uh, the FAQ. So. Um, it's like, so. Yeah, so so I'm saying that those are the types of human actions that are that are not interfering with other people. Those six. Um, so to answer your question, um, I think it, my 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 perspective is that it's very very important to to get it squared away rationally uh, what the right what the right concepts are what of libertarianism. Um, I only wrote my book, I mean, I didn't write my book because I thought that uh, Murray Rothbard didn't have a right general idea, or Ayn Rand didn't have a general idea that was right. Uh, you know, I, I wrote it because I think that we need some really precise scientific conceptualization in order to be able to make a, 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 a solid argument to, to actually convince a whole culture to go forward. And so I think, uh, for, for me, it seems like the most important thing we could do is argue with each other and figure out what the right argument is to bring to the culture at large. Um, and I don't think this approximate sort of, uh, an approximate sort of methodology can work. I think you're just going to, I think it's just not going to work. Um, what do you mean? Approximate? So, yeah. What exactly? Do you well, like, like, Libertarian Party is a is an example of where we don't want to be divisive. We want to just go wherever we agree. That's what matters. We don't want to talk about. Yeah, what we I understand what you're about. saying. So you don't want to go over general to the point where, which I'm I'm in agreement with. <laughs> actually, I'm in, in agreement with you on that end that we should. Um, 
we shouldn't try to accept every single person. We should try to be able to have set arguments. Um, I think the non-aggression principle is a good way to go on that. Um, and I think there is a there is a uh, there is a split right now within, say, the anarcho-capitalists, actually, just between even them, which has to do with uh, how the non-aggression principle applies to children. Um, and this has a lot to do with the work, actually, of Stefan Molyneux, uh, who brought up, you know, h how using aggression upon children is uh, immoral. And by doing so, you are working, you are, you know, just as bad as any government who's taking from people, who's using violence upon other people, if not even worse, because you're doing it against people who completely rely upon you. Um, so, I, and it's something that he brought up, which I kind of do agree with, which is a person who speaks abstractly about the government and says, like, we should be a Democrat or anything else, right? But treats their children incredibly well has really positive relationships with people in their own lives, um, does not use violence against their kids, listens to them, meets their needs, is truly accepting the non-aggression principle more than a libertarian who talks about how terrible the state is and then goes home and beats the shit of his kid or spanks them, you know, whatever term they, they decide to use. Um, I think the non-aggression principle has to be held towards children in order for there to be a substantial change because using violence against children um, not only is immoral but also leads to um, devastating results Maybe. and acceptance of violence. It's a Stockholm Syndrome. The way people talk about the state, um, they know what's best. It's okay that they use violence. It's the same way that they talk about their parents and it's the same way in many of the cases they talk about their spouses when they're abusive towards them. Doing the best they can, it's a really hard job. Yeah, so that kind of shit. But um, So I guess what we're trying to get at is what do you think needs to happen or how do you think we need to reach out to people on an emotional level, you know? Because um, I think that people aren't persuaded merely by facts. So I think, uh, you know, Gross Tyson put it well. You can sort of look at someone and say, here are all the facts. Um, if you don't accept them, then you're an idiot. But typically when it comes to teaching, we sort of have to empathize with someone's feelings in order for them to have a reaction and accept, you know, ideas. So how do you think that we need to sort of convey these notions, you know, to the general population in order for them to be receptive? Well, I, I guess I'm not the one to ask about how to appeal to, to their emotions. <laughs> um, although I, I do appeal, I do, I do appeal to perspectives. Uh, so like, if I'll t I can talk to a liberal and I can understand what their issues are and concerns are. And like, for example, they, they blame a lot of problems on capitalism, for example, or they, they, uh, they want Obamacare, for example. Uh, and you can address the things that, that they're responding to that they don't like. Uh, you can trace those to rights violations from their perspective. Uh, and so you, you can try to see, because a lot of liberals, they're not, they're not all like really bad people, you know, like that they just want, they just want yeah. the government to be all powerful. They're actually trying to solve a problem that they're perceiving. And many times it's actually a real problem, but the problem was actually created by a kind of fascist sort of corporatism kind of thing. Right. And so if you can explain that perspective to them, it kind of opens their mind up to seeing the, the liberty orientation, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But that's not addressing emotions, that's just addressing right. facts. Uh, I, I don't know how to address the emotions, you'll have to ask somebody else. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll call Brett and be yeah, <laughs> and second right. the other people. But um, I, we, we are running, I, I think we're that, running at like an hour main, and like five. Um, is there any, uh, hour and nine now, but if I do want to hear this last comment though, I do. Um, sorry, but before... If, if there's anything you want to close with, kind of message your book general message anything else i mean obviously we'll we'll uh we'll throw a little on the info we'll have an amazon link to your book and everything else uh -huh. or individual rights um no no it's just if, if somebody has a question they can they feel free to contact me uh whistler at gmail.com w-i-s-s-l-e-r at gmail.com and they, they have a question or whatever um i think that regarding previous thing that I think we all see things from a certain perspective and we all have slightly different perspectives and I think if we want to get to the truth 
we kind of have to hammer out with each other and try to see things from each other's point of view, but we have to hold to reason and say there's a, there is a, an answer here and we can get to that truth. But we have to entertain uh, different perspectives to I think do we that. completely agree with you. <laughs> I mean, it's we'll see. Uh, okay. it's, uh, well, I mean, well, in that, in that statement, yeah, we need to, I think we, uh, we need to use reason in order to reach our, you know, conclusions always. Um, so, and I think that we agreed with you far more than, you know, it seemed like we disagreed on some things. <laughs> but, uh, Interestingly enough. So, uh, everyone, thank you for watching us, and we will be back soon. We're going to be interviewing Kinsella on Monday. And um, just one last point I want to bring up. Um, my heart goes out to Stefan Molyneux, who I know just came up with um, a, a very bad diagnosis of uh, cancer. Um, so, Steph, we hope the best for you. Um, he was going to do an interview with us on the 30th. We didn't know why he had to end up backing out, and now we much know why. So hope that's for him. So go out, support freedomainradio.com. Send your money out there. Those people are they're fucking beautiful. And they have uh, – Stefan Molyneux has changed so many people's minds and has done so many great things for uh, humanity. So um, definitely send him some cash. And um, – That'll that'll be it. I'm going to end on a sad note. Thank you um, so much for joining us, Shane, and having this discussion. Thanks for yeah, having me. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. Um, you know. That'll be it. Uh, <laughs> see you all later. Bye. Bye.